Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good day, wherever you are, whatever you're doing. I'm glad you're choosing to spend some time with me. So today, I get to talk to Doug Connor all about his book, The Blueprint, How to Get Unstuck, Six Practical Steps to Lift Your Leadership to New Heights. And I'm super excited. I have a lot of respect for Doug. The people that have endorsed this book have a ton of respect for Doug, and this book is fantastic. And we're going to talk about leadership today because it's super important today and really every day. So how you doing, Doug? Great. Great. Awesome. Happy to be with you. Cool. Well, I'm excited that you're here. So so first, I, I got to say, you know, as the former CEO of Campbell Soup, now the founder and the, the president CEO, you know, the, the head honcho at your own leadership organization at Content Leadership, I have to tell you, I have to ask, I mean, how did you get started on this leadership journey that you're on, Doug? Well, in 25 words or less, I, uh, as I started out in the book, where I, when I really jump-started my attention to leadership was when I was fired from a job uh, at, at the age of 32 years old. And uh, I was working with an outplacement counselor who challenged me and said, Doug, you don't have your act together. Uh, you can do better, and uh, you need to work at this. It's like anything else. You want to excel at something, you need to work at it. So in a nutshell, I started working on leadership uh, a long time ago, 35 years ago in earnest. And uh, I've been a student of it ever since. And uh, if there's one thing I've tried to do every day over the last 35 years, it's try to do a little bit better today than I did yesterday. So I've been on this continuous improvement journey, which involves learning and applying and learning what works, what doesn't work, and just working it in a way that worked for me personally. And uh, I've been on this journey now for 35 years in earnest. I've worked for 45 years. So uh, well, I'm still working today. I've got a, probably another 45 ahead of me. Excellent. That's fantastic. So you you will become the uh, the the swami of leadership at uh, seventy years or eighty years of leadership, huh, Doug? Yeah, I'm counting on it. I I had a I, I was doing my financial plan a few years ago with my financial analyst, and he said, "How long do you want to run your plan out for?" And I said, "I'm a little over sixty. I feel like I'm a little like around halfway. Let's run the plan to 120." <laughs> And he said, but we don't run financial plans that far out. I said, you do now. So we ran my financial plan out until I'm 120. I'm going to be worth a lot of money at 120. So that's my goal. I'm going till I'm 120. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, if you're I'm looking to adopt, you let me know. Yeah. So I've got a ways to go. Fantastic. Wow. Well, if you're looking to adopt, you just let me know. I'll come, uh, I'll help you out with the tech. So that's funny. <laughs> so, well, I, you know, you share that story about uh, so well in the book about getting fired and kind of finding yourself. And you talk about how important it is to find and share our true self. But what does that really mean, Doug? I mean, that sounds really nice. But what does that mean in practical terms? Well, you know, one of the first things, it, it's, it's getting in touch you know, I, I, I think the a key line from the book is we, we, we say, and I, I strongly believe this, that your life story is your leadership story. And so uh, most people really haven't examined their life story and sort of said, well, where is this leading me? I, when I was fired, the first thing I had to do uh, with my outplacement counselor, he said, I want you to handwrite, handwrite your entire life story and the story of your family. I want it all. You got two weeks. So since I was unemployed, I had lots of time. Uh, I, two weeks, I hand wrote it, I turned it in and he, he read it. Uh, and then two weeks later, we had another meeting and he said, Doug, the, the you I'm coming to know in this, in this life story and the way you are presenting yourself to the world are two different people. On one hand, he didn't say this, these are my words, you're playing the game over here, but your identity is over here. And he said, you know, you need to be true to yourself and you need to get well anchored in why are you choosing to pursue this path and what do you believe? He said, you're going to be challenged time and again, and you're going to have to have the courage of your convictions. And right now, you don't know what those convictions are. 
because you haven't examined your life story. If you, if you go in there and examine it and reflect on what you've learned and what you believe in, it will anchor you so that you'll be in a much better position the next time you have a career challenge like this to deal with it. Right now, you're not prepared for it. So uh, what I found was I, I, my, work, my work self and my personal self had to become more one and the same. And uh, I've been working on that for the longest time, 35 years. And I've got to tell you, the more I merge those two identities together, the more fulfilling the journey is because I'm showing up as the person that I, I feel I, I am trying to become. So it, it's been uh, life changing for me over time. Of course, I'm slow. It took me 35 years to get to this point. And as we were writing the book, we thought, you know, we can jumpstart this whole process for people so that in a matter of 10 or 12 hours of work and done at a, in a way that works for and whoever's working on this book, uh, over the course of a month, a couple hours here, a couple hours there, people can anchor themselves more in, the, in, the, in their own identity and then begin to figure out a way to show up at work where they are showing up as the leader they hunger to be and uh, and they find that more fulfilling and then they start trying to do a little better every day. And that was the journey I was on. And it's so important to be in touch with your, your, your real self. Yeah. Yeah. I totally agree. I think that's, that's really important. And also to align that with the work that we do, because uh, you know, as you, as you mentioned, the more aligned we are, the more we're able to bring that forth. And so I, I would guess that you probably don't believe in work-life balance on that. It's a really whole life. And we just happen part of the time we're working and part of the time we're living and they should really be kind of one and the same. Is that right, Doug? Well, I think, well, it's a full life and, uh, uh, and, and you have to live it, but you, you know, uh, at work, you're living it in service to the enterprise. At home, you're living it in service to your family. Uh, when you're doing working in the community, you're in service to the community. Or if you're in your church, you're in service to your faith. Uh, I think living a life of service that speaks to you in a deep and profound way, uh, people will give you energy in the fullness of time and will give you the capacity to excel. Excellent. That's, that's, I totally agree I, that I find that, I find that's very true in my life and the more of myself that I bring forth. So not that everybody's attracted to that, but a lot of people are, and that really helps us connect better and really bring forth our energy because energy like attracts like, right? Energy attracts energy. And that's really, that I, that's helped me well, in, a lot. In the book, we, I talk about, there's a wonderful David Brooks TED talk. He's also written a book about this recently uh, called The Second Mountain, I believe. But he, he his TED Talk is about, and David Brooks is the New York Times uh, cultural commentator. Uh, and he, he his TED Talk is about, should you be living your life for your resume or your eulogy? And uh, he's articulating that, you know, we get sucked into living the life for the resume and we neglect our eulogy virtues because the resume virtues, the parking spot, the corner office, the accolades, uh, the bonus uh, can sort of take over our lives too much. While the uh, eulogy virtues, the things that you want people to say about you when you're gone can tend to be deeper, more, uh, more subsumed under the surface and can easily be neglected. And uh, our approach that we talk about in the book is bringing those two things together in a way which the blueprint process does of living for your resume and your eulogy, but doing it in a thoughtful way that fits into what for everybody is an, a cockamamie life. Uh, now with the pandemic even more so, but even before, uh, it's, it's a crazy world out there and we need to work a little harder to figure out how are we going to make this work for our resume, our work life, and for our eulogy, our whole life. 
And uh, I'm here to tell you it can be done. Awesome. 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 Yeah, I like you. You pose you posit an, an overarching question in the book that I think is really fascinating. And that's how can I get unstuck, change my leadership life, which is kind of what you talk about there and maximize my impact. But then you close that with in a way that works for me, which I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I don't see a lot of people talking about that in a way that works for me. So why is that? Why is that in that, Doug? I, I, I'm not hey, sure. Hey, it's it's mission critical. All the leadership stuff that's out there uh, or going to get your executive MBA at Harvard or Kellogg, where I went to school, uh, all that stuff is just not practical or approachable for 98% of the world of leaders. We all have 11 things to, 11 things to do on a 10 item list. You know, we're all swamped. You know, we're spending more time thinking about work or doing work than anything else in our lives. And uh, uh, so what you have to do, I believe, is come up with a process that makes this pursuit of leadership excellence approachable. You know, when we wrote this book, uh, it became two books. The first half of it is, is focused just on how can I approach this daunting task of becoming a better leader in a way that works for me. So we created this six step process, which is approachable for anybody uh, so that today's leaders could actually get on this path. All the, most of the books that are written are written by people who never had to lead anything. They study leaders, but they never walked a mile in their shoes. And and they're not in touch with the reality of how hard it is to do all this every day. Well, I've walked a mile, I've walked a thousand miles in, in all these leaders' shoes, and uh, I know what it takes. And I know we, we had to create an elemental, simple process to deal with an incredibly complicated thing called the life of a leader. And, uh, and so we ended up, putting the blueprint, the first half of the book is, here's how you can figure out what works for you in a way that will fit into your cockamamie life. And then in the second half of the book, I share with them what works for me. But the most important thing is helping them figure out, a, find a way to explore how can I lift my leadership to new heights in a way that works for me. I was just on a call with uh, upwards of 200 different leaders just a few minutes ago. And I got to tell you, all 200 of those leaders are completely different. They know what's expected of them by their companies, but they are all approaching it, approach, approaching it differently. And all of those leaders in some way, shape or form have a perspective on how they want to lead that's informed by their life story and their study of leadership in some way. And they're all different. And all of these aspiring leaders need to know need to figure out how can I honor my uniqueness and show up as I am in a way that'll help me have higher, greater impact in whatever organization I'm a part of. Uh, that's the secret and, and leaders need help. They feel stuck. I teach in a lot of places and uh, in a nutshell, they feel stuck. That's how we put a little un get unstuck on the, on the front panel of the book because that's what they're asking for. Help me get unstuck. I want to do better, but I'm swamped. How can I do better? Well, our attempt with the blueprint is that's that's what we're attempting to do. We've done this work with hundreds of leaders and found that it gets traction and helps get them on a new path. So I have a lot of confidence in it as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, you've got six steps here in, in the blueprint, which I think are fascinating. Envision reflect, study, plan, practice, and and improve. And then it's, it's kind of an endless do loop, right? We just want to keep right. getting a little better every day. But which, I mean, which one of them is the hardest one, Doug, in the work that you've done? Because like you said, you've worked with hundreds of leaders, probably thousands of leaders. What's the hardest one for leaders to get right? And what's the one they usually get wrong? Uh, 
Well, I have worked with I have worked with thousands of leaders. Uh, we've actually worked this process with hundreds of leaders. So, uh, the the play and the, the envision step, the first three steps: envision, reflect, study. In the envision step, you you sort of we give go through a very simple process for you to decide why am I choosing to lead, knowing that it won't be perfect, but you can make it better the next time. The next two steps: study and reflect. I mean, reflect and study. A reflect step is reflecting on your life story. What are the, your core beliefs about leadership? We, and then we go to the study step, the third step, which is, okay, that's what I've learned in, in my life. Now, if I look at the world around me, if I study life beyond the four walls of my existence, what can I learn from the world around me? And you learn some things. The fourth step is the hardest. There you have to actually take your purpose and your core beliefs, and create what we call a leadership model, which speaks uniquely to you and how you want to show up every day as a leader. What are what are your tenets? What are your core beliefs about leadership, and how and uh, how do they work? So we actually take people through a design process to literally create a graphic of here's how I want to lead, and that is hard for people initially. But then they find it inc incredibly liberating because it's not about making somebody else happy. It's about how can I make myself happy in my own leadership journey. And uh, we have on our website at conantleadership.com, we have samples of different models from different leaders that have been created. And what's interesting, I've worked with hundreds of leaders on this. No two leadership models are the same because every individual leader, Phil, yourself included, your your leadership profile is informed by your personal aspirations, your life story, your life situation. It's different than anybody else's. It's 100% totally unique. And when people get into the model building phase on planning in, in step four, they can feel a little challenged at first, but then liberated. That's the single biggest step. And, and it's all about building your own personal leadership model that speaks to you, that can guide you and help you, can guide you in times of tough decision making, like the middle of a pandemic. And uh, so that's probably the most challenging step. That makes sense. That makes sense for sure, right? Finding the, finding the plan is really hard, right? Defining that, getting that wrapped up for ourselves, Writing, definitely. Putting it down on paper and committing yourself, okay, this is what I believe. That's That can feel like a heavy lift. But when people do it the first time, they get it about 60% right. And then as you iterate through the process in a continuous improvement mode, it gets goes from 60 to 65 to 70 to 80 it, it, it gets highly uh, relevant very quickly. I guess I would add one other thing, and that is the plan is great, but a good plan well executed beats a brilliant plan poorly executed every time. The fifth step is about practices, and that's about how are you going to show up and bring this leadership model that you just created to life in a way that's tangible and visible for the people with whom you live and work. How are you going to show up differently? And uh, and so that's the CEO in me saying, all this planning is great, but what are you going to do? How are you going to deliver on it? And so we work really hard to identify, okay, how are you going to show up on Monday and be more of this leader while honoring the leadership expectations of your company or your nonprofit organization? How are you going to show up differently on Monday and bring this model to life? And that otherwise, it's just a planning exercise that will drift away from you in no time. It's the bringing it to life in step five. This is actually the fun part because you've already figured out the model. OK, now, how can I bring it to life in a way that works for me? And uh, that's a fun part, but it's essential. The sixth step is just, OK, do it over again. Whip through it again. Do, have you learned anything about your purpose or your core beliefs changed? Do you think you should tweak your model? What's a new practice I can have? And you start to cycle through this thing in real time. And uh, you start to trans, you change your leadership contribution profile. Excellent. Yeah, that, that, that improvement, that 
that without that improvement, right, then we worry too much about step four and, and we don't ever do anything. So I think reminding us at the end there that we need to improve, that we can improve and that, you know, a, a good plan well executed is way better than a brilliant plan not executed at all. Super important, Doug. Really great point. I appreciate that. Yeah. And I'll just build on it. And the one thing, another key point we make in the book is that we say forget perfection. It, it's it's not going to happen. The world will change by the time you've perfected your approach and it'll have to change. The goal is just to keep getting better and uh, and and to be true to yourself and keep getting better in a way that works with the people with whom you live and work. You know, a lot of times we, we, leadership can start to feel like rocket science and unapproachable. This is not unapproachable if we approach it in a bite-sized, thoughtful way that honors the crazy lives we live today. And, uh, and, and I, I've seen it time and again, and I know people can lift their game and find a way to do this in a way that works for them without having to change their entire life to do it. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. You talk in the book about the smallest ways, right? The smallest ways that we can do that. So Doug, if we're going to pick a smallest way, what's the best way? Obviously they should definitely get a copy of your book. Definitely get a copy of the blueprint. But besides that, what's the one small thing or two small things they can do today or this week to get started on that journey? What I, what I would say is what we, 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 we encourage people to do is uh, examine their life story. I'm telling you, your life story is your leadership story. And uh, uh, so think about what you've learned in your life. Uh, and... Uh, and what are your core beliefs about what it takes to be a good leader? I mean, you learn something from your grandparent or from a coach or an uncle, occasionally from a boss, but rarely is it from a boss. It's usually from someone that's been close to you who has had high standards for you, but they've cared about you a lot. And, uh, and you carry some sense in your leadership DNA. You carry a code with you that's been informed by all those interactions. And if there's one thing to do, I would say get in touch with your life story and then let that inform your leadership story. Uh, that's, and, and you don't need my book to do that. If you get my book, it'll be easier, but uh, that's where it all starts. Your life story, uh, your leadership story is your life story and vice versa. Excellent. So folks, so get started today, get started on your life story so you can find your leadership story. If you want to go deeper with Doug, definitely get a copy of the blueprint, six practical steps to lift your leadership to new heights. You can go to contentleadership.com and check them out. But Doug, if people have questions, what's the best way? Do you have a favorite social network or a favorite way that people can get in touch with you if they have questions? Well, we're available at Doug Conan. Uh, we're very active with uh, a Twitter uh, Twitter at Doug Conan, also on LinkedIn and Facebook. We've got a growing conversation going. We're up uh, pushing 400,000 followers, just talking about leadership every day. And, uh, uh, and the underpinnings of this are my leadership philosophy, which is clearly available, available at ConanLeadership.com. I would also say, just in terms of Conan Leadership, I don't take a salary. I make no money from this. Not, I, the, whatever we make, we use to cover our cost of doing business, which we keep to a minimum. And then if we make more than that, we give it away to like-minded organizations that are trying to lift leadership to new heights in smart ways. So this is not about, we're in this for all the right reasons. Uh, we wanna build a better world and we wanna do it now. And, uh, and that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> that's beautiful, Doug. Thank you so much. Thank you for writing the blueprint. It's very helpful. Thank you for spending some time with me today and for sharing your insights so freely, Doug. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you.